Now, one of the things that I was thinking about this week, um, I, I saw a quote from James Baldwin writing about Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. um, where he said, you know, the, the fuss about Jackson, he was talking about the mid-80s, mm -hmm. um, the cacophony about Michael Jackson wasn't really cacophony about him, it was a cacophony about us and American, I think he said, burning, buried guilt mm -hmm. about this country as the custodian of black life and black wealth. Mm -hmm. He, too, suggesting that there's something at the core What's interesting is in the period that you're talking about and even the circles that Hubert Harrison was living in was still a kind of controversial statement. Right. Well, he ran, he ran into great obstacles. For instance, he, he developed criticisms not only to, uh, in the, uh, towards the Socialist Party and the labor movement, essentially concluding that they put white race first before class. Which, which is they very, did. Yeah. I mean, they were the Socialist Party right. in the last of the 19th century was right. still a segregationist party, didn't really believe in organizing people of color or organizing across the color line, although there were exceptions, Right. Obviously. When Harrison joined, there's only 1% pe uh, people of color in the party. He leaves not only only because of racism towards black people, but also towards their, on, because of their position on Asian immigration. He's a great internationalist. He refers to himself as a radical internationalist. So what is his lesson for us today? Well, I think, uh, first, the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy in the context of class you know, change, in, 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 in social change. Um, that's the key in this country, how they maintain control, and we have to take them on on that issue, I think. Um, and so, for instance, when Paul Krugman writes in the New York Times talking about this economic crisis that's going to be around for a good decade international in scope and says we need uh, an FDR type New Deal, well, Harrison would be critical of that, I think. And the reason is, as Ira Katz Nelson at Columbia has written in When Affirmative Action Was White, every program and policy of that New Deal was shaped in a white mm -hmm. supremacist fashion. So when we go to make these changes, we have to look at every issue and see how is white supremacy shaping it. And what do you mean I how it was shaped in a white supremacist I, w fashion? Well, for instance, the GI Bill, right? The way they would steer people who would have access, who would, you know, housing. And each program and policy, who gets covered in labor legislation, who doesn't get covered, what groups mm -hmm. of people. Now, other historians have added how it's also in a male supremacist. Uh, but, but Harrison would would be particularly focusing on white supremacy because it's so central to how they rule. Booker T. Washington and W. E. B. Du Bois had their differences, obviously, yes. but Harrison differed with both of them. Yes. How? Um, on on class issues, on uh, proactive policy. Booker T. Washington had Harrison fired from the post office after Harrison criticized him. Harrison considered uh, Booker T. Washington very conservative, particularly his position against labor unions, uh, organizing like that, and his political philosophy. Because he kind of believed in a black capitalism. Right. Now, in terms of Du Bois, um, Du Bois emphasized a talented tenth. Harrison emphasized the common people, working, building from the bottom. Interestingly, in Du Bois's autobiography, Dusk of Dawn, written in 1940, many years later, he kind of comes around to Harrison's position. Harrison also, Du Bois was very active with the NAACP from its founding, and Harrison um, developed a criticism early that the NAACP had no answer about what to do if the white minds you're trying mm. to reach don't uh, respond. Now that was manifest in World War I when Harrison criticizes Du Bois openly. It's, it's, the, it's the, probably the period Du Bois is most, most regrets in his entire life because Du Bois writes close ranks, an editorial which says we must forget our special, black people must mm. forget special grievances during the war. Harrison also in that period is advocating federal anti-lynching legislation when the NAACP and du, du Bois were not. Mm. Most people don't know this history, the first 10 years, and the reason they were not, the NAACP was not supporting federal anti-lynching legislation. They didn't want to alienate Southern white support, mm. right? And this is all documented. Now here's an issue that a lot of people in this country and in, our, in the progressive world grapple with often and that are the, the, the frailties of human nature and, and you write about the open sp outspokenness of, of Harrison but mm -hmm. you also say he uh, was sarcastic and that his um, the alacrity with which he said whatever he thought might have actually served him uh, a disservice in terms of his lasting impact as his biographer have you come to any conclusions about that, such that might hold advice for those of well, us who wonder how often to bide our tongue? Well, I, I, no, I, I actually think um, Harrison was nurtured in these black working class intellectual circles in New York at St. Benedict the Moore Church and St. Mark's, where freewheeling debate and speaking openly and speaking your mind forthrightly, but it was never mean-spirited from mm -hmm. Harrison, right? And they would go out and they could have drink, co they have coffee or beer, whatever. But he clearly I, alienated people was, as much uh, as he uh, wore people. Uh, people yes, right? sometime, but I, I think, I actually think 
issue after issue, what he's saying is correct. And I think it's more the content and the way he said it. I don't actually say he's, I mean, some, some contemporaries say he had biting sarcasm and things like that. But um, when, when I, I'm working mostly from printed documents, because I, I, you know, I don't get to hear what he said, and his printed documents are actually pretty accurate. So I, I, even though I'm his biographer, I am not so hard on him for that. And I think there is actually much to learn from him. Arthur Schomburg, who delivers a eulogy at his um, funeral. Of the Schomburg Center. Uh, right, and Harrison and Schomburg are two of the four founding officers, founding, you know, of the committee that sets it up. He's a, as you said, he's a great he's one of the premier black culture institutions in the East Coast. In, in the world, really, it is. It's a major resource uh, re repository. And uh, Schomburg says that Hubert Harrison was ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why I think he's relevant today. What he said, you know, resonated back then, but he has much to teach us and that we can learn about even today how to approach these problems of race and class very forthright manner. I, I think it's very instructive. All right, Jeffrey Perry, thank you so much. Good luck right. with your second volume. Hubert Harrison, The Voice of Harlem Radicalism, Volume 1, just out. We'll look forward to more. You're watching Grit TV.